Hello, everyone. It's Dave Paulson, head basketball coach at George Mason University for episode number 11 of my Distancing Dialogues. Today, joined by my first ever assistant coach uh, 26 years ago, uh, when we were both a little bit younger, uh, Pat Duquette, now the head coach at UMass Lowell. Duke, great to, uh, great to have you. Hey, Dave. Uh, great to join you. Uh, it's hard to believe that it was, I don't know, 26 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. When you gave me my first opportu uh, opportunity in, in college basketball, paid me so well. Oh, <laughs> tremendously well. But you didn't pay for too many meals. I didn't pay for too many meals. And we ate well, Dave, yes. given our salaries. Yes, we did. We did. And it just before we – we're just – this time it's just going to be all a discussion. Before we do, again, for those who are just watching, um, this is something that I would normally do with, with Pat or other assistants – X and O, talk about philosophy. We're, we're making this available. In Pat's honor, I'm donating to D.C. Central Kitchen, uh, a relief agency in, in Washington, D.C. area. They've served over a million meals during the pandemic. Um, you know, great organization. Um, CEO, uh, Duke, Duke is a fellow Williams grad, is Mike Curtin, uh, oh. Williams class of 85, I believe, or 86. Um, so, and the only thing that we'd ask anyone who watches, if you sound, found something of value, uh, consider donating to any relief or agency in your community nationally. So that's the intro. So, so Duke, 26 years ago, uh, my first assistant, what do you remember about that year? Well, I remember you coming to my house, uh, first of all, meeting my parents, which um, was impressive. That's not usually what happens during a, a job interview, but uh, I remember my dad kind of grilling me a little bit. Um, you know, he said, you're only going to pay my son $3,000, He just, but you're going to take care of him, right? And you kind of gave him a gentleman's handshake and said, yeah, I got him. So uh, that was the first thing. And the second thing was how damn far Canton, New York was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a great place. We, we had a ton of, I had a ton of fun. I learned a lot. Um, it's just not easy to get to. I think I put on 50 or 60,000 miles on my little Toyota Celica. Um, you remember half the time yep. I would stay with my sister in Albany and just kind of recruit from there. Um, but I think it was, I think we both would say it was a great starting point for both of us. Um, and, and along those lines, um, I can't thank you enough. I mean, talk about well, helping me find my, my passion and my lifelong career. Uh, it started with you and Canton. Yeah, well, and it was, and it worked out all right. That gentleman's agreement with your dad. Sure did. You, you, you ended up doing all right. We had a ton of fun. We were trying to rebuild a program. And uh, this was, of course, before GPS. I don't even know yeah. if there was MapQuest at the time. <laughs> so I gave you, I gave you a, an apple and, yeah. and, a, and an atlas and told you to go find some players. And, and, and you did uh, exceptionally well. And, and, um, and it was a lot of fun. And the, yeah. and the mistakes that we made there were mistakes in anonymity. So you're like, wow, that didn't work out so great. You know, how can we do it better? And a great learning experience for all of us. Yeah, that's a good point. Not a lot of people were watching. <laughs> no, I mean, which is, you know, I always, um, uh, you know, worry about somebody who's, you know, first opportunity sometimes is like at too big a stage, like, it's a lot different, you know, being an assistant to a head coach. Um, and we'll talk about your transition from yeah. here. Um, but let me, along those lines, Dave, if you don't mind me asking the first question, because I didn't become a head coach. We, you and I, you know, had such different paths. You became a head coach so soon. And I really was, a, you know, a longtime assistant and learned under a bunch of guys. Uh, I, I just almost marvel when I think back at how soon you became a head coach. And how, how, how do you be, be ready to be a head coach? You were, what, 27 years old, 28 years old? You know, I mean, I think it – I don't know how you felt. Like, how old were you when you became a head coach at Lowell? 42. Were you ready then? Well, that's a good point. That's I mean, it's like, kind of like being a parent, right? Yeah. Yep, yep. You're, you're not or, – or, or, or getting married or, yep. or, or whatever it might be. Like, you're not ready till you do it, you know. Yep. Um, and certainly I didn't have the same level of experience. Um, 
you know, working under people at different spots at different places as you were able to have. Um, but, but again, then I learned in the luxury of like, you know, baptism in fire. Right. But the stakes were a little lower, you know, yep. and again, that's no disrespect. Like I loved our time at St. Lawrence and, and, and great teams and we had great experiences, but when you made a mistake, um, you know, you could go back and learn from it. And, you know, there are 150, 200 people in the stands and, um, you know, they're more worried. Again, your number one job for sure on the Friday night game was to make sure you got the wings order in before the kitchen, before right. the kitchen closed at the St. Lawrence end. And I was good at that. You were very good. You were very good. <laughs> you were very good. Um, so take me through a little bit, though, like from, from St. Lawrence, kind of like your progression in coaching until you got the head coaching job. Well, yeah, obviously, I, I spent a year with you, and um, I don't know if, if you remember, but I interviewed for the assistant's job at St. Michael's College under Tom Crowley. Uh, Tom O'Shea was his top assistant, so it was the second position uh, there. Didn't get it. Came back to you, and like a week later, Tom Crowley called me back and said something happened. The guy that took it left. You know, you're still interested. So... Um, yeah, I went there for – got a huge pay raise from three grand to, I think, seven grand. Um, big bump. You doubled your salary. It was a big bump. But I had I was the equipment manager. I had to do laundry for all the uh, athletic teams as well. So it came – you know, other duties as assigned. Yeah. A um, couple years there and, uh, you know, caught a couple breaks. I got my master's degree, which was great. Um, Tom O'Shea ended up getting uh, named head coach at St. Mike's, bumped me up to his, his top assistant. So – that was my fifth year, I think, total uh, out of Williams College and in, in coaching. My average salary was five grand over five years. So, uh, and, and you and I both know you don't get in this thing for the money, and that was never important. Uh, but I will say it was nice to to make twenty four grand and get insurance and be able pay to go taxes. to dentist, <laughs> pay taxes, be able to go to the dentist. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, that was a big break, and then obviously my, my biggest break was was um, heading to Boston College. And when Al Skinner took the job in '97 from Rhode Island, I had gotten to know Tom O'Shea's brother Tim and Al and his staff. So they had one spot open at BC, and you know it wasn't the coaching spot; it was the ops or the administrative spot. And obviously, um, you know I, I ran at that opportunity. So not knowing where it was leading, and in I think one of the important things, Dave, for me, um, eventually in my career, to move up from that administrative spot to the coaching spot was the experience I had with you and at St. Michael's. I, I, I was coaching and I was recruiting. Um, and, I, you know, the very little advice I try and give young coaches is if you can get that opportunity, even if it's not Division One, like you go to Division Two, Division Three, and you're hands-on and you can get some great learning experience and get on the road recruiting, which I think is such a huge part. I mean, you've got to, got to learn how to recruit and bring in players if you're going to be an assistant coach. So even though I went to Boston College and I was the ops guy, eventually we turned the thing around and I was able to contribute in that position, even, even recruiting players, because I had had those earlier experiences. So when Tim O'Shea left in 2001, we turned the thing around. Um, you know, Al promoted me to, to assistant coach. And I think, you know, uh, it was really important that I had that experience, regardless of what level, um, you know, on the road recruiting. Um, and, and, and so I could be seen as a coach. Um, and, and we just had a great run, Dave, you know, at Boston College. I, I can't say enough good things about Coach Skinner and the other coaches I worked with. Um, you know, we went from last place to first place in 2000, 2001, and went to seven NCAA tournaments. Obviously, we transitioned from the Big East to the ACC. We had success there, too. So really was fortunate um, in a lot of steps in my career. But uh, landing at Boston College uh, was, was a great, great opportunity. So a couple things I want to follow up on that. So, so one, because I do think it's really important. Um, what you said uh, to me, um, there's so many, and there's more administrative positions 
in college coaching now than there ever were. There's more coaches in quote unquote non coaching positions. And, um, you know, one of the things is I, you and I share the same view. Um, you'll have somebody on your staff who's awesome. Uh, he's great, works hard, knowledgeable. And, but the question in harder, um, you know, for me in the A-10 now is where recruiting is so, so essential and, and so cutthroat, to be frank, that yeah. very, very hard to ever promote somebody who doesn't have that coaching and recruiting experience. Um, and, uh, and again, you've got a guy in your staff, Nick Leonard Deli, who I hired as my operations director uh, at Bucknell, and he had done that. Or was he at Rutgers Newark? Yep. You know, he had coached, he recruited. And, and, I, yep. and I recru hired him like if there was an opening on my staff at Bucknell, okay, I knew I could promote him. Now I didn't end up having an opening. You get the job at, at Lowell, and, and he's been with you now for, for quite some time. So to, that's one thing. I think the second thing is how long were you in the administrative assistant or ops position at BC before you got elevated? To, to, to the assistant coaching position. It was three or four years, I think. Uh, and I think, and I, to me, that's the other thing, okay, is, um, and this is a conversation, two guys who may have some answers, may not have any answers, okay, but at least our perspective. Um, you gotta be patient, and, and you gotta be willing to quote unquote pay your dues, and, and you can't rush the process, and, you know, I think a lot of people in, in your same position may have done your two years in the ops or administrative assistant position and bounced to a job and then hope to get back to Boston College as assistant where you, you, you paid your dues, you served your time, you showed your work, and, and you were able to be elevated. Yeah, no, I think it's a fine balance, right? I mean, because you're, you know, you want to be aggressive and you want to continue to learn and grow and but you have to be patient too and there's only so many opportunities and you don't want to make uh, a bad decision um i will say sometimes you got to get lucky too um you know i actually interviewed um my second or third year um with that same thought like i got to get back on the road you know i want to be a coach and a recruiter i don't want to be labeled an administrator um so i interviewed with Armand Hill at Columbia okay, uh, for an assistant coach position, which would have been great. I mean, the Ivy League, you know, national recruiting footprint, um, I think it would have been a really good next step. But if you go down that path, you, like you don't know where it's going to lead. I mean, turns out he, he was fired the next year. Um, now, would an opportunity have come up at Boston College? I don't know. So, you know, I I think I was patient, and I think you need to be patient, and, and sometimes you got to be a little lucky too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about Al Skinner and the genius yeah. of Al Skinner, but before I do, I was thinking about this when I was, you know, thinking about what we're going to talk about today. Um, on that staff at BC, yep. he had four future head coaches, yourself, as you said, Timmy O'Shea, who went to Ohio University, and then Bryant, uh, Bill Cohen, who, who's still the head coach at Northeastern, has done a phenomenal job there. And, and obviously Ed Cooley, who, who left BC and, and went to Fairfield with great success and has is, is, is done exceptionally well at Providence as well. Um, that's unique. That's, that's really unique to have four head coaches. Yeah, and I think uh, for a few years there when Coach Skinner was at Kennesaw State and Tim was coaching, all five of us were coaching at the same time in Division I. And – I don't know. We talked to Andy Cash. We couldn't think of another staff where that was the case. Um, but, uh, yeah, re really good staff, a lot of fun. You know, you don't really realize it until later, you know, how, how good a staff that was. And everybody was a little bit different. And, obviously, ultimately, the, the credit goes to Al. He put that staff together and turned the Boston College program around. And uh, each one of us kind of contributed in different ways. And, and like I said, everybody was a little different, but we got along really well. Was there something you think in, in, in terms of what Al did that, you know, was it that 
he hired four amazing potential aspiring head coaches and they became head coaches or was there something he did in terms of how he ran the program, the responsibilities that he gave different people that enabled or empowered uh, all of you to become head coaches? I think so. You know, exactly what you just said. You know, he, he empowered his assistants, uh, recognized their strengths, let them do their jobs. Um, you know, that doesn't mean he, he didn't make, he made all the decisions and he oversaw everything day to day, but you know, he, he, he let you work and he, he gave you a lot of responsibility. Um, you know, as an assistant coach, you couldn't ask for anything more. I mean, that's the best way to grow and develop uh, as well. But the other thing Al did, um, he just instilled confidence. Um, you know, his demeanor, his approach, he instilled confidence in his staff and his players. I mean, we went from last place to first place. Like, that's really hard to do. And coaches always talk about, you know, the process and you got to learn how to win. And, you know, it takes time. Well, we, he did it in a year. And, and a lot of that, I just think people believed in him and they believed in his message um, and in the way he carried himself and still that type of confidence. We also transitioned to the ACC and there was a lot of uncertainty. A lot of people that said, there's no way we can do it. Our style, you know, won't work. I mean, he, he just instilled that, that, that type of confidence in everybody. Yeah, I think, you know, and I think back, um, the coaching job that, that all of you guys did at Boston College was certainly, you know, Coach Skinner does not get anywhere near the amount of credit that, that it deserves. You know, and BC is a phenomenal place and it's great academic tradition and, and great location, but not, you know, from my untrained eye, not as resourced as well or supported as well. I mean, it, you know, like really um, you can make the argument that he did more with less um, in terms of resources or traditional basketball power as well as anyone has done. No, I agree. And I think, you know, time always uh, tells the story. I mean, since he left, you, you know, you see they've struggled. And, uh, you know, I'm good friends with Jimmy Christian. He's a great coach. Um, he's close to getting it back. Uh, but they haven't been to an NCAA tournament in, I think, close to a decade. It's, it's a great place to work. It's a hard job. And, and just like you said, just the resources relative to your competition, right? If you look at the Boston College campus, and you, you know, you're, you're like, come on, this place is great. It's heaven, but you've got to look at it uh, with that, with those lenses and compare it to the other facilities. And then keep in mind why 17 and 18 year old kids are making the decisions they are like, they're not, they're not focused on the same things you, you or I may be. So right. when you look at the practice facility, when you look at the attendance to the games, you know, those are the types of things that help uh, and hurt in recruiting. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no question. Yeah, it's funny when you think about it. Um, it, it Religion still required there, right? Like I believe. So I went. I had two daughters. I'm like, you gotta go look at Boston College. You got. And I remember sitting in the group information session at Boston College, thinking like, this is awesome. This is great. And my daughter's like, Dad, can we leave? I'm like, really? You know, and just to your point, like, I think, um, um, you know, and obviously every school's got that, but there's, there's challenges. So beyond Coach Skinner, like, instilling comments in the players and the staff, what were the other, you know, aspects of his genius, if you will, to enable uh, you guys to have so much success there? Well, the other thing I would say um, is he, he minimized conflict, um, you know, conflict it's all around us on the court, off the court. You got 13 age, 18 to 22 year old kids. You got a staff, everybody's competing. You got a heck of a lot of testosterone in the room all the time. You know, you're, you're this far away from a lot of conflict. You know, like I said, on and off the court, I just thought he did a great job of minimizing that uh, and never turning a bad situation into something worse. Uh, he was really, really good at that. Um, so I think that that was one of his, his, his big strengths as well. Um, I forget your original question, but, you know, that, yeah, the, the way he managed his staff and players, you know, I've tried to emulate that. 
Um, we take something obviously from all the people we, we work for, but that was one thing I said, I want to, I want to be like that. I want my guys to play loose and free. I don't want to micromanage, you know, same thing with my assistants. You know, I want to be there and I want to uh, help, help manage them, but I don't want to over, over manage. And I want to let them to do, do the jobs and I want them to be comfortable to speak and, and to give input. And, um, that was something I wanted to throw out to you as well because um, I'm always trying to find ways to, you know, I want my guys to, to, to speak more and, and contribute more. And um, I try and do that in practice and give them control over, over certain segments. There are times in the game when I want them to say more. Um, I just think that's really important, right? First that you hire good people and then that you get, get, get the good stuff out of them. And I think Coach Skinner was really, really good at that. Yeah, and that's, that's a real fine line because I would guess at times, you know, the people who are able to just not micromanage, and that has not always been my strength. You know, it's like, you, you know, at times to an extreme, you know, they play with confidence, they play loose, they're not overwhelmed by the moment, and they play great. But on the flip side, sometimes it looks like, holy smokes, they're not coached. You know, sure. they're not playing with discipline, you know. Sure. So finding that balance of discipline and freedom, you know, I think to me that's that's the age-old question. Yep. Coaching. You yep. know, discipline, freedom, structure, and 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 uh you know, just the ability to be free flowing, if you will. Yep. Yep. No, I agree. And and you know, is it it's probably a different approach on offense and defense, right? You want your players to be more disciplined and structured on defense and you want them to play loose and free on offense. And I, I question myself sometimes, you know, that am I too offensive oriented? You know, we're a great offensive team. We've led the league in scoring the last three years, but we're not very good on defense. And do I need to change my approach? Do I need to change my personality, get out of my comfort zone? You know, do, when I'm watching uh, practice and I'd like to hear what, hear you say when you watch practice you know you should be focused on everything but you can't are you 50 percent of the time offense 50 percent defense uh you know how are you able to balance that and or or do you have to remind yourself hey i gotta coach a little more offense today or how, how do you handle that I, I, I certainly gravitate more towards the offense i mean i think that is like this is great because this is this is really at the heart of coaching like yeah. your eye is going as a head coach is going to gravitate towards one end or the other. That's and right. I, and, um, um, and I do believe, and you got to empower your assistants and you got to, you know, give them a voice here a hundred percent, but whatever the head coach values, whoever the head coach is, I, you know, <laughs> you could, you could walk out and your assistants, the head coach, it, it, it doesn't, it's whoever the head coach is, whatever he or she values, it's just subtly imparted yeah. to the team. And, and I do believe, I remember one of the earliest clinics I ever went to here, Jim, Jim Calhoun, like you can only be good at three or four things. You can't be great at everything. Um, now, you, you want to try to improve, I think, in my opinion, in the areas that aren't as good. And, and you know, we're going through – now with the extra time you know we've had and you know when we get done here we've been meeting two three hours a day with our staff you know kind of reevaluating everything we do offensively defensively how can we do it better but i do think it comes down to where your eye uh, goes and it's funny um because i would argue if 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 you change your approach um you'll become better defensively and then all of a sudden you say, man, we can't freaking score. You know, <laughs> I mean, it is, you know, now I think veterans and, and veterans and depth and, and more all league players, if you will, sure. allow you to, to, to change your focus. So interesting, you know, um, uh, you know, I remember at, at Bucknell, um, I felt like when we get good enough players, we have really good players. We need to become better defensively. And so it was – I had always been looking at the offense, correcting the offense, tweaking the offense. And, and, you know, it was a staff meeting, like, Coach, 
forget the offense. If we can guard, we're going to be really, really good. And that's got to be your emphasis every day. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be your focus. And it was, and we became an elite defensive team. And then with really, really, really good talent, at times we struggled to score. And we just, we were better than some of the other people. So I, to me, it's something I, always, I still struggle with. Um, part of it, what I do is, okay, this, this aspect of practice is a defensive focus. And, and I'll tell the guys, okay, I'm watching the defense. And Coach Simpkins or Coach Johnson or Coach Joseph or whoever's on staff, you know, and, and I, one thing I do think I've done better, you know, Coach Simpkins, you're watching the offense. Coach Johnson, you're watching transition defense. You know, Coach Joseph, you, you got the box outs, um, um, if, if that's it. And then this is a segment I'm looking at the offense. And Coach Joseph, you got the defense and, and trying to um, assign specific areas of focus in each aspect um, in, the, in the workup. And then when we start going live, this is what I've done is I end up coaching, a, you know, for us, the green team, you know, the, the, whether it be the top seven, eight, whatever it is, and we might switch shirts um, back and forth. Um, and then I'm watching whatever they're doing, defense or offense. But if you're sitting and watching practice and you've got the green and the white team and you're trying to correct defense and offense, you don't correct anything. But it, it, it's really, it's really hard. Yeah, that's interesting you said that because that would be another argument to break practice when you do play into top seven versus your next seven. See, I don't do that. And I know at Williams College, we, we did that when we played for Coach Sheehy, and obviously you do that. Other coaches do that. Um, I don't. We mix up the teams every day. Um, but that would be a reason to, to do it that way is where I could take the team – and then you're focusing on your top seven guys. Huh. I had you know, it's an interesting thing. So two years ago at Mason, and we, and we had a lot of competition um, for, for playing time, for role identification, which ended up being um, a little bit of our undoing in the non-conference. This is two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we were expected to be good. And so I really wanted to watch everyone. And so I waited longer. So I had an assistant take the green team, assistant take the, the, the white or the gold team. I don't know what color of practice jerseys were that year. And I waited till longer and longer and longer. And I watched everything. And um, I don't think we had the same toughness and focus at the beginning of the season as we needed. Um, mm. and uh, and also, I think the guys have to get used to me coaching them. Yep. I'm gonna, however you're going to coach in the game, I think they have to get used to you coaching them that way. So last year I started right from the jump. Uh, we got out of the gates great, 11-2, and two, uh, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is we lost the third most games to scholarship players to injury of anyone in the country. We had 91. 91 Games missed to scholarship players, which trailed Louisiana and North Carolina. So I think we would have had a really good year. And I thought that that was important. But there's always that fine line because then there's a perception, okay, coach isn't you know, paying enough attention to whoever 8, 9, 10 is in your rotation. And there's no question about it that, you know, I, I am probably very – dissimilar to Al Skinner. So I tend to be a little bit more um, demonstrative, a little bit more uh, passionate what, or, you know, attention to detail and really being maybe a little bit more of a taskmaster. Um, and, you know, perception that players 8, 9, 10 or 9, 10, 11, you know, maybe didn't get held accountable quite as much. So I think that balance of you're coaching defense, you're coaching offense, you're coaching the top eight or nine. There's there's positives to any way. Sure. Unintended consequences. Yeah, I guess the other, you know, possible um, negative to that could be chemistry, right? 
you, you know, you may have good chemistry one through seven, but you know, eight through fourteen may may not be crazy about one to seven. Right. You know, I, I would think that would, could be another possible thing, but like you said, there's pros and cons both ways. I do think I need to. I, I'll probably do some type of hybrid where I'll keep it the same for a while. But I do think, to, to your point, I need to start coaching the top seven or eight. You know, a little sooner than I do. And I, you know, my assistants have been great, and they've subtly and not so subtly told me that um, um, I probably go too far, um, yeah. and, and, and um, probably need to do it. Because, like you said too, I coach differently during the game than I do in practice, and I know. You don't want to, but the reality is I do. So they've got to get used to, you know, to me coaching that style as well. So um, this is good. My assistants would be happy that uh, we're having this conversation. <laughs> well, they texted me on the slide. <laughs> I'm sure my guys got you. Um, but but it's, it's – I think as coaches, we are either perpetuating what we saw that we liked, okay, or we react, you know, to the other extreme where, you know, we're not going to be like that. And I think obviously that balance, what are the other, it's interesting because what are the other things that your assistants, because <laughs> I'll tell you mine too. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I wish, you know, and that's the value. You don't want yes men or yes oh, no. Like you Absolutely. want. So what are the other things your assistants would say, Duke, we love this, but gosh, you know, we need to change this. They want me to play more zone. Okay. <laughs> and why? I don't know. Everybody wants me to play more zone because we, cause we're not very good at man to man. <laughs> okay. And my, my argument on the other side is, well, we're not going to get good if we keep changing and we've just got to get older and stronger. Um, that'll help. Like we can't do that overnight. Um, but of course, we have a zone, right? We got just like you have a second pitch in baseball. Right. How much do you work on it? You know, how much can you and still be good at your primary defense? We can go back and forth on that forever. Uh, but there's no question, um, especially when we're losing, there's at least three or four points in the game where they're all whispering, like, who's going to tell them to play zone? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know that I'm running away because I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Um <laughs> But that, 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 that does lead to a question, you know, and it's, it's funny. Um, and I told you, like, we're going through our, our evaluation of everything. Um, and, you know, we have yet to get to where I'd like us to be defensively here at Mason. It's taken longer. But I do think getting older, getting stronger, you yeah. know, we've been hit uh, by the injury bug um, quite a bit. But – you know, there's the people who do multiple things well defensively, you know. Um, and then there's, you know, obviously the best example, certainly in our state, you know, Virginia. And it's like, yeah. this is what we do. And so, you're primarily man, man to man, yeah? Yes, we've been almost exclusively man to man. Um, uh, and now, interestingly, last year, um, my assistants convinced me. Um, and, and we played three-quarter court uh, pressure, uh, and it was exceptional for us uh, in our non-conference and early on. And then, um, you know, we were playing with depth. We were playing with pace. We were yep. playing with multiple ball handlers. And then my best player, we fractured his foot um, and, and, and missed the rest of the season. Uh, the guy who was my leading scorer in the non early on uh, my starting point guard got really, really sick and missed. Effectively, he missed like nine games. Now, he played, but he was he, he was unable to function. And then, um, you know, our freshman guy who ended up starting at a point guard uh, limped to the finish line um, and ended up having to have, you know, uh, some work done on his knees um, in this offseason. So we went from being guard-oriented and – and really, really pressing, and I loved it. And it didn't impact our half-court defense for the most part. Uh, and then we had to stop it just because we just, you know, we didn't have the depth. And at the end, we we replaced a freshman center in our starting lineup for our senior combo guard, who was our best player, right. you know, Converse candidate. And that necessitated, you know, a host of changes. But it was interesting. That was the most 
that I've done that, we've played a little bit of zone as a, as a changeup. Yeah. You know, and, again, how good can you be if you don't practice it? But if you practice it more, then does that water down the efficacy of your, you know, your man-to-man? Exactly, yeah. Um, Dave, do you, do you force one way or the other? Do you force baseline? We still, we're still we force like, take away baseline. It's the words matter, remember? Not yeah. force mill, take away baseline so that the majority of the help is, is centered in the middle, which, again, is very um, uh, rare in, in the college game. Now, more people force baseline. Again, I think Tony Bennett still takes away the baseline. But again, there's there's pros and cons for, for both approaches. How about you guys? So now we're back to forcing baseline. Uh, I've changed in that area, and I don't feel good about it because I I think you know I think you got to choose one and, and stick with it. But uh, we've struggled to guard guys off the dribble, and that's I guess another thing I'm looking for in the off season is good one on just one on one close out drills uh, you know we got to get better at that so there was one year where I just said hey no straight line drives like you know we're, we're getting beat so often um, but we're back to forcing baseline now and that's where we started I went away from it for a year and now we're back to it when you went away to it did you just say I don't care which way you force yeah just just, just play keep the guy in front of you yeah uh, half him on a strong hand like that's what you should do but keep him in front of you no straight line drives right so and what led you to change back? Um, probably the belief that we need to know, the whole team needs to be connected and know which way we're forcing. Which way the help is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. yeah I, I think, but I think guarding the ball, and it's certainly at the Division One level, Ooh. and certainly now. I mean, I think the, the ball skills and the ability to attack off the bounce keep getting better and better and better, you know. Um, and that yeah, wasn't great. Right? <laughs> it wasn't as good in Williamstown, Mass. No. in the late 80s, but no. uh, I couldn't agree more. And I, I'm looking back at, you know, our tape and when you self-evaluate and you, how are we getting beat, man, we're getting beat off the dribble more often than not, you know. Um, so we're, I got, we got to try and get better in that area. And it's not – I don't think that's an easy thing to work on in practice because it's – it's competitive, right? I mean, you're just going at it. So it, it, it can get heated. But we've got to work on that. We've got to get better at that, at that for sure. Well, it's interesting. So we had a, a guy here, who, uh, a Jared Reuter, who transferred in from Virginia. Yep. It's a lot. Like, a pick his brain. And, and, and I read an article about it, and I just would love to see it. But I think, you know, Tony Bennett, they do, like, three-on-three three closeouts. They have a, a – a, a name for it and you basically have to get a stop or like or you stay on and it, it might be you know and again this is back when teams were working with their guys in the summer before the pandemic but it might be 45 minutes like no we're just you know like there is no second option right the option is you figure out how to guard and and give the appropriate amount of help but then close out to your guy and that requires like a tremendous investment of time and also a certain amount of, I don't know what the word is, courage. You know, I mean, like, forget the rest of the practice plan. Forget yes, right. it. Like, we're going to get this covered. But certainly, um, you know, there's been no better defensive coach in the game with the possible exception of his father, you know. Um, yeah, it's true. Yeah. But then you're, you know, um, you know, I would guess without knowing it took it took a few years for Tony to hit his proper sledding, you know, at Virginia. Um, then when they again, you know, early on they probably didn't look so great offensively. If, right. If you're spending, you know, so much of your time on the defensive end, then that has consequences on the offensive end. So it's that that balance that dilemma. Is always is always a challenge. Yeah, along the same. This is same probably question, same balancing act 
is, you know, ball screen coverage. You know, do you want to have a variety of ball screen defenses or do you want to be really good at one? And, you know, you, you can't have both. And also offensively, we play, you know, a continuous ball screen motion, which I know you were for a while. Did you, are you still doing that? Yeah. 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 So, you know, offensively, you want to get good at seeing varying uh, ball screen coverage. Yeah. So how do you simulate that? And obviously we will drill, you know, a lot. The, 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 the various ball screen defenses, but it's not the same as seeing it live. So uh, I guess what is your primary ball screen defense? How much variation do you have? Yeah, that's, um, yeah. That's, that's, that's a great question because that has changed. Again, uh, ebbed and flowed, and, and I do agree um, it's hard. This is, this is our philosophical discussions that – we're going to go on probably next, you know, the next two weeks. And yeah. the study is how good can you be at different things? You know, so, uh, and that's evolved because, um, you know, when we had great teams at Bucknell, we could, uh, what we call cowboy, but drop coverage, if you will. And, and you're playing the ball screen two on two. Um, and you're not in rotations. And if you can do that, uh, you know, I think, that's, I think that's the best thing you can do. But when we came here, and part of it we were trying to rebuild, and part of it was the guards <laughs> in, this, in the A-10 are, boy, they're elite. Um, yeah. and, and so now if you commit two to the ball, whether it's a hard hedge or a flat hedge or a trap, um, then you have to be in rotations, and and uh, you got to drill those rotations, and those take a, a lot of time, okay. you know. And um, and I do think like and so we went to really aggressive hedges on the ball two years ago. We got out of the gate seven and one in our league, and then teams started to scheme for it, you know. And and so I do think there's a need to um have a secondary coverage i i do i believe that like you've got to have a secondary coverage the problem is if if you have if your secondary coverage isn't consistent with your primary coverage um that creates the dilemma so in other words when we kind of morph back to you know, kind of drop coverage, if you will, as your primary, and then maybe an aggressive hedge or aggressive um, two to the ball against, you know, elite cards. Um, you know, sometimes that changeup would be really, really good, but sometimes the guys, maybe you went three, four games without having to be in as much zone up coverage on the backside. And right. then all of a sudden you have to go to that aggressive hedge and there's not a guy at the hoop and you give up the layup and you, you know, so is that because of a lack of depth and the injuries? Is that because of inexperience or is that because it's, it's very hard to do both? And, and again, I think you could probably do both, but then you're spending less time on your secondary break or. Something you know, else, yeah. yeah. It's just, how about you guys? What, what, what do you guys do? Yeah, same same thing. Like we're we're gonna cowboy. You you use the word cowboy too, or hedge? Yeah, yeah it must have came from you then. Cause last year I was like, why are we calling this cowboy? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's one thing I'm I'm really big into as well is whatever we're gonna call it. Let's all call it the same thing. Yes. you know that drives me nuts when coaches say the same thing eight different ways. Like I, I you know, let's just call it one thing. Be consistent and remember that our players aren't in the office, you know, studying basketball 10 hours a day like we are. So, um, but yeah, so we'll hide Cowboy. And then um, our secondary is, is downing, um, you know, or switching I don't think requires, you know, much yeah. connection off the ball. So you can always do that. And um, I, more and more teams are, are switching against us. Um, I'm curious defensively what teams are doing against you but I do see actually some 
uh, variation in how they play the ball screen that's based on personnel with us. Right. Which is interesting to me because, you know, um, that, that a team will adjust that much to play us. But they, they will. They'll go over or under. Um, and, then, um, and then switching we're seeing more and more of. Right. So it's interesting. So, again, I, I do think the more veteran team you have, yeah. the more you could probably do multiple things. Or the more you could do, um, we're going to do this to this guy. You know, yep. cover this guy's ball screen. Yep. Um, and we, we will switch, <coughs> you know, to me, uh, our four man's coverage, we might switch that <coughs> based on you guarding a, a conventional big um, as a four man or you guarding a guard as yep. a four man. Yep. Um, so. You know, it, 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 is, it is really neat, uh, interesting. And in our league, and I've told people this, and we got 14 teams in our league, and most every other league I've played in, teams ended up gradually playing similarly. There, it, it, most leagues, I seem, have like a kind of a yeah. consensus of we, how they guard ball screens or how they play offensively. You could not find a more dissimilar league in terms of how people play on offense or how teams play on defense. It is it's really fascinating. It, it's it's um, you know an interesting you know it's it's intriguing for me yeah. to prepare, but yeah. it's also yeah uh, you know it's exasperating too because you know there's no continuity you know and you're gonna have to change. Um, so we were talking about this um, in our discussions this week have been more offensively, and we're like, you know, uh, a good number of our teams, you know, I think the teams that have been really strong defensively, um, you know, VCU, uh, Rhode Island, um, you know, Duquesne, uh, really hard, aggressive on the ball. Uh, a lot of times, two to the ball. Um, Dayton, uh, St. Louis is mixed up, but they've done a lot of what I would call cowboy. Um, you've got some that are switching. Um, you've got a couple that are downing, not as many, not as much downing, and not as much switching with the five. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I thought when Golden State had so much success in the NBA, I thought we'd see more switching one through five. Um, we haven't seen yeah. as much of that. In the NBA, we were talking about this yesterday in our staff meeting, the NBA for a while was almost exclusively a downing yeah. offensively. But now you see a lot more of the Cowboy or drop coverage. High Cowboy, you know, the Bucks with Giannis. It's a, like a low Cowboy just stand at the rim. Um, uh, so it's, 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 it's so much variety. Um, let me ask you this. So your ball screen continuity, how are you doing that? Are you lifting your opposite big all the time, keeping them low, or or you vary it? Yeah, we vary it. He stays um, above the block in an athletic stance, and it just depends on also how, how they're, they're, they're playing, right? If they're going to low cowboy, then we're going we're gonna to drive it, and he's going to pull, pull back to the porch. If they're going to hard hedge, he's running to the nail. So – you know, he's going to be there and he's going to read it, but he's also going to know after a while how they're playing the screens. And he knows if they're hedging, he's coming to the nail. Coming to the nail, but not necessarily the top of the key, like um, like kind of a European ball. Oh, no. We have, we, we have one version where we lift the opposite forward. I, I see what you're saying. Where, where we, lift him, we lift him before the action even happens. The rest of the time, we keep him on the block and he reads it. Yeah. And so you want him, that, which is interesting. So this is good. So you have him above the block. Yep. And then um, I think what, I, what you call the porch, I think I call – that's what – I think what you call the porch is what I call lunch spot. So if you see that if it's kind of a low cowboy, he's going to back up where his rear end is almost on the, out of bounds. Correct. And if you see a hard hedge, he's going to go to the nail. Yep. Okay. 
And yeah, it gets hard hedge. We're, we're playing through our forwards. And I, I make no mistake about it. Like I tell the guard, get off the ball. Right. But is, is your baseline that with the opposite forward either at the block and either get into the nail or get to the porch? Yep. And then your, your counter, your variation is, is lifting. That's right. But are they separate calls, like separate? Yes. It's not like they can make that read. Uh, no, no, we're, we're lifting them. We're, we're calling something different. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, all right. That's good. How do most teams guard in your league? Um, I mean, almost all, all men, we don't see, we, no, other, there are no zone teams per se, but teams that have zone, uh, as a secondary defense for sure, but they're mostly man and we're seeing more and more switching on ball screens. Um, and what do you do against switches then? Same thing, get to the nail? The first thing we do is, is slip at the, point okay. of, at the point of the switch. And okay. we've had really good forwards and skilled, smart forwards. So they get a really good feel for that. So the guy that catches the ball, first of all, when they're switching, we, don't, we, we want him to have a live dribble. So, so don't put it down. Keep a live dribble. Now you got to slip right to the forward and we play. or you know, if they if they back up and they mess up the switch, well, then you got to drive. So it's slip one, drive two. Um, if the forward thinks he can post up the guy when they're switching, then go set it and say flash. You're going to go post up. We're going to dribble down to the baseline, try and get it in. We're going to flash the opposite forward. Right. High low. Okay. So those are our two um, – options the other thing we can do is is uh we call it westbrook if we can't get it into the post we can go to the high post can't get it in usually the reversal is open because they all collapse right but if he comes back to the guard who has a forward on him then we'll evacuate that that post and we'll drive it oh westbrook okay oh, i like that but we get so good at the slip and the slip drive that, then that keeps the ball moving. Right. That's good. Um, do you do anything differently against switch? Uh, that's about, you know, we'll try to, um, again, it depends on where your strength is. Like, do you really want yeah. to get it to the, to the forward, you know, then, then the slip or, or the high-low? We call that a shirt, you know, yep. throw, throw back. We'll try to, you know, dribble it back the 45 degree to throw in yep. or you know if we're kind of in a spread uh you know where there's a guard in the corner we throw back and throw it in there uh and then we've used you know if we got a, a guard that we want to really um attack the big then we'll we'll call it a boomerang where he'll pass and get it back kind of what you said like what yeah. yeah get it back um so that's those are you know you know, again, and my thing is we we're going through our process. Like, I think it's so important to practice against every kind of defensive um, tactic. And you're right. Like, the one thing that we don't do, I haven't done, is down ball screens. You know, and so making sure that that we get used to going against that. Um, uh, hey, what's your What's your plan of attack against downing? Uh, and we varied on that, you know. Um, I, I think a lot of times, uh, to me, is if you can um, not even not even reshape the screen, just in a sense refuse the screen. So the biggest, you know, the guard is sat up on not letting them get to the screen. And the biggest down there protecting. Sometimes they're up aggressive. Sometimes they're more passive. You know, refuse it and try to hit that pocket pass. Yeah. Um, to, to, to the forward who can then shoot, score, play opposite, or come right back to the guard. Yep. Um, or, or we might reshape the screen and try to see if the guard can snake it. Um, yeah. But uh, – and then usually against that down, you know, the, the guy at the nail is the guy who might rotate to uh, yep. the forward. Yep. So making sure we dive – Dive the nail guy. Yep. But we call it dive the 45, so the 45-degree angle. Yep. Um, 
so that's you know mainly what we do um you know right now um we got like a few minutes okay yeah. this has been great like just talking um what um what are a couple of things that teams in your league do offensively like i'm always like all right what what do these guys do well what's one thing i can steal so what are the things from your league offensively that like boy this is really hard to guard um why don't you go first on that one <laughs> well ob Toppin, that would be one <laughs> yeah anthony um, anthony lamb right no Good it's time. funny because because one of the things that i do um i try to give my assistants each like three or four edits to do of what I want to study yeah. their offensive teams. And one of them was Vermont. Because they get the ball to Anthony Lamb at the elbow. Like yep. really, really well in space. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, for sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, Yeah, they share they share the ball really well. Um, they drive their guards drive are really hard to guard off the off the dribble. Yeah. For for our league, you know, for our league, it's all relative. But, well, for any league, yeah. yeah, for any league, but but you know, they they play pretty simplistically. It seems like to me, as an outsider. Yeah, no question. Ball, yeah, balls in the right guy's hands. They got right space, and then they they get they get the closeouts. Um, yeah, you know, for for sure. Does anybody do something in your league that's really unique or or different on offense? I see so many of our teams are doing ball screen offenses now. It just so so Dayton, um, you know, was one of the most efficient teams in the league and in the, in the country. Yeah. Um, and so they run the ball screen continuity where, for the most part, they're lifting their opposite four. Yeah. Um, and they've got some good reads and counters on it. Um, you know. Uh, St. Joe's, which is not necessarily, you know, they didn't, you know, Billy Lang was inheriting a, you know, it was it's a little bit of a rebuild. But they play five out and they shoot like just a ridiculous amount of threes. And, you know, it, it puts you in, you know, it gives you some dilemmas because they're five minutes out there, you know, shooting threes like crazy. Um, you know, Richmond, who had a great year and finished second in our league, you know, is 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 playing like Richmond, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, obviously they have their own nuances to it, but uh, um, you know, Princeton on steroids and and much faster, and um, you know, they really do some, you know, unique and interesting things. So you know, um, uh, Duquesne. Just they, they seem like they get the ball to the elbows and they get the ball to the blocks. They just run simple sets and they just kind of beat you up, you know. Um, so I, I think there's just a variety of stuff. And I think one of the things that the coaches in our league are really good at is is they have their actions, they have their actions, they have their actions. Then out of a timeout, there's a wrinkle to it. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it, it, it really you know, puts you on edge. Uh, constantly. Yeah. Um, a- anything else in your league that's just really unique or interesting or? Um, like I said, offensively, you know, I just see so much of this ball screen with slight variations, whether you're lifting the forward or not, whether you're setting, you know, the middle screen or you're just reversing it to a, a side ball screen, but um, not a, not a ton of variety there. Um, um, Albany is is defensively. Uh, I feel like they're able to mix up their ball screen coverage, you know, real effectively against us. Um, Maine, I think, is he's done a really good job there. Um, you know, in a short time, defensively, I think they're really, really good. Um, defensively, especially. Very, very good. Yeah. What yeah. makes them so good defensively? Um, and I just think they're quick to their rotations, and they're con- you know they're connected, yeah. uh, more so. 
than most teams. Um, those would be the two that come to mind. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, it's just, I mean, one of the things, obviously, during this time, you know, I saw somebody tweet, the poor kids on these teams, when they come back, as coaches have been doing Zooms and, and watching film of all these European league teams and NBA teams, and, you know, these poor kids on the teams are going to come back and they're going to have 42 different ball screen coverages and 82 different sets, which is, which is you know, we've, we've engaged in so much study, which has been fascinating. But at a certain point, it, it does go back to one of the very first clinics I ever heard from Jim Calhoun. You can only be good at three or four things. So, yeah, it only matters what they can absorb, right? And remember, yep. I mean, yep. it's great that we have it. Um, and it's fun to study it and, and, and get new ideas and bounce ideas off each other. But at the end of the day, you got to choose just enough that they can absorb. And, yeah, that, that's my only other question I wanted to ask you. And I know, I know we're run, probably running out of time, but along those lines with scouting reports, I've, I've gone back, back and forth, and I think I've come full circle on, on that. Um, where I give less and less. And, you know, unless you have a senior laden team, I don't think anybody can get that detailed with what you're giving the the players, not necessarily what you're talking about as a staff, but what you're choosing to give to your team. I'm very, very picky and selective about that much more so now than I was when I first started. I just don't think freshmen and sophomores when they're still learning your own system can then remember a scout report and all the things that go into it without losing their focus on your stuff. Yeah. And um, I would agree with that. Like to me, like we give them, you know, a written report, but it's three or four things on personnel. Yeah. Each guy, yep. you know, more of a driver, more of a computer, more, you know, likes to go left. Like, you know, that's going to help them. Uh, we watch the same film at it two days in a row. You know, my thing is like, if we're going to guard, you know, I like that. So we, we don't change the edit. The same one. Exact same edit. Yeah, okay. that's good. Yeah. This is, this is what, um, and I would say, like in my, you know, you can always do better. But I think our scouting and preparation is probably one of the better things we do because I think we focus on what's really, really important. Yep. Like I don't feel like there's ever been a game where our team wasn't prepared without feeling like they were paralyzed. You know, and that's like that's that. You know, as, as Tark said, the 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 more a kid thinks, the slower his feet get. You know, and I think that that. Um, so we will. We do have a scout team. You know, we have a every third. You know, every assistant's got every third scout. They they will have. We, we might be going five and zero offense with one group. With the scout group is 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 getting through. You know, the other teams. Uh, the three or four main things. That's it. Yeah. You know, like what's they run this, they run this, they run this, they run this. That's fine. Give that to me in the long edit for me to be aware. Maybe out of a timeout. What are the three things we have to guard? And then we guard it. Um, you know, for one or two days, depending on how many days we have in practice. We walk through the exact same things. We watch the same film. It. This is what you're accountable for. These three or four things. And this is how we're going to guard, you know, this. And obviously, again, you might have two ball screen coverages. But um, because my experience is there are different ways to disguise stuff. And then there's 15 actions that you're going to see during the year. That's you right. Know? Yep. And again, we try to do all that. We And one thing we do try to do is we try to cover two or three actions a day. Yep in the preseason yep. and give it a name. Yep. You know? yep. um, uh, and so then, you know, when we see it again, how about yeah. you guys? I love the idea. Um, I, we watch less and less, I believe um, almost the same things you do. Give me the three, two or three things. That's all we're going to give them. Two or three things. What do we want? We have a scout team. Um, I've limited them to one 10 minute film session. But I love the idea of showing the same clips two days in a row. I would like we're gonna do that. Like, all right, now you got ten minutes of film both days. Yeah. Show the same thing. Just 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 drill it. Uh, I think that's really good. 
And um, yeah, like you said, give me more. But and then we we've we've done the same thing. You know, we put together the list of actions and we try and do that in the preseason. And hopefully, you can get through it a couple times so that now you know you can reference it without teaching it. You know, brand new again. So it's a similar approach, but definitely less uh, than I did when I first started. Um, yeah, I think you I, want to control everything, right? Your head goes like yes. it's, it's like it doesn't work that way. Yeah, and then you give them a, you know, I had one one time I had a sister, they were great. They had like 15, oh, let's give them the diagrams. No, 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 no we're not. They say, this is what we got to do. Um, you know, and again, if you box out and you don't foul and you don't turn the ball over, you got a good chance to win it. And if yeah. you make free throws, you got a really good chance to win. Right. Um, all right, last question for you, too. How much film of yourselves, of your team, do you watch as a whole team? Uh, how much do you watch of, of you know, individual, you know, Johnny or Jack or whatever with you? How much do your assistants do? Um, because uh, it's the same thing. Like, and the context is, we don't. I, you know, my assistants would like me to watch more with our guys, and there's that fine line of like, I'm. I think one thing our teams have not tended to get stale at the end of the year. Like I'm very mindful of not, you know, especially January, February, early March, taxing them mentally too much either, like keeping it fresh, keeping it short enough. So how much do you guys watch film of yourselves? Okay. So uh, I love this question and it's <laughs> something we all, we've all put a ton of thought into. Um, the majority of it, especially early on, is one one on one with one of the assistants. Yep. Um, but we also the way our offices are set up, and I, I love the way they're set up. We're getting new offices this year, and I had to plead and beg to have them set up the same way, where all the assistants are in the same office complex. So a kid comes in, he doesn't have to choose which assistant he's going to talk to, and each assistant hears what every other assistant's doing. So it keeps everybody on the same page. It's great for communication. Um, it's, for me, it's a great way because we do so much, I do so, so much of my decision-making collaboratively with their input. So I just sit down and we talk. We don't have to schedule a meeting. Anyway, it, I just love the way it's set up and it's a big part of who we are as a program. It also allows players to not have to choose, you know, which assistant necessarily they're going to talk to. But a lot of our film is done one-on-one. -on -one. But all the chairs have wheels on it too. So if assistants watching and I hear it, I'll you know I'll zoom my chair over and I'll add a few things here or there. Um, they, they, my coaches like when I lead team film sessions. Uh, I think they would want me to do that a little bit more, but I'm careful about it for the reason you said, Dave. But also, you know, players get sensitive when you're when you're being critical uh, yep. in front of their their peers. So sometimes I think. We, we need to do that, but too much of it, I think, is not good as well. Um, I, I personally used to beat myself up, especially after – I'd watch a game two, three, four times. Right. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I do less of that now. I, I have to watch some of it right after the game. But I remember my old boss, Dana Skinner, when I told him that, he looked at me and goes – and he, he used to form my head coach. He goes, why would you do that, coach? Like, you just got to let it go. Like, so – I've tried to, to do that a little bit more. I don't know how you are with that, but usually I have to watch some of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I watch yeah. all the time, but then it's like finding that fine line. Part of it is, okay, you're going on to the next game, you know, and you want to yep. have – like, you know, we have to have – this is a struggle, a mechanism um, by which we, um, you know, assess the game. Right. Give some valid feedback to the game that's constructive, that that's allows it to teach, but then lets it move on. And, and I think, you know, and what, what obviously the challenge is, you know, okay, we won, right? So, yeah, everything's great. You know, it's all positive, and you show a few clips, and this is great. Then you lose, and it's like, you know. Right. Uh, so, you know, one of the things I think we're going to try to do is like um, – 15 clips after a game or, or 10 clips after a game, and that's it. No more, no less, you know. Um, 
as a team? As a team. Um, uh, because a lot of times I, I haven't. It's been more individual. But this is at least for my sister. Like, you know, we got to do it as a team. Um, but So you and I are, are more on the same wavelength. Like, like, I've always been a big believer, less is more. Um, and, and, and keep them fresh. And just like you said, guys get sensitive. So there's that fine line of wanting to make sure you're teaching and correcting with not, you know, just pounding it into them and not just, you know, always feeling like they're under the microscope. So yeah. the more it, we, the more we talk, the more I feel like we're, you know, we're always trying. It's a big balancing act, isn't it? It is. And everything, defense, offense, coach the green team, coach the white team, yeah. uh, correct, but give confidence. Um, and I think the best coaches find that balance. And I think the balance obviously is different you know, at the same school from one year to the next based on, you know, who you have and yeah. how you guys are doing. No question. I could go on for three hours. It's been okay? great, DP. <laughs> and, and there's a chance that <laughs> we start with 500 viewers and it ends down with one who get all the way through. <laughs> okay. But uh, my mom will be happy with it anyway. Then. So that'll probably be the only one. Um, hey, thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks, DP. And uh, just send me a link. I want to donate either either to the same cause you do, or I'll find a um, a mirror uh, company up here. But um, I'm happy to donate to yours. So uh, DC Central Kitchen, DCCK dot com. Got it. And uh, when this post, we'll have that little link. You know, my my graphics guy does a great job making it look decent. I don't know yeah. what he can do about the, our physical appearances, but the rest <laughs> of the video look better. Sounds good. All right, All right. pal. Take All care. Right. Talk to you soon. All right.